But let me read this fifth chapter of 1 Peter. Oh, let me just go ahead and read it. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by constraint, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory. That does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the sweetness of your spirit here today. Thank you for these beautiful worship songs. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your love. We ask, Lord, that you would bless now the teaching and the preaching of your word. We recognize, Lord Jesus, that all power in heaven and earth has been given to you. And we pray this morning, Lord, that for anyone in this room who is being oppressed by our adversary and whatever difficulty they may be having, would you in your power deliver them, rescue them, strengthen them, lift them up, and bless them abundantly? We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This portion of 1 Peter is very different than the first four chapters because Peter, though he has mentioned a couple of things that were personal, he speaks more personally in this chapter than he has 
in the first four chapters. He had identified himself as an apostle of Christ. He expressed his uh, commitment to teaching the word of God. And, um, but here in this fifth chapter, he opens his heart up. And he begins by speaking to the elders. He says, the elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by constraint but willingly, not for dishonest gain but eagerly. So he's writing to those men who were given the responsibility to pastor. Uh, The word elders here is used uh, in other places by the word pastor or overseer or bishop. And in my absence over these last number of weeks, those of you who've been here have, have, have had an opportunity to witness the elders whom God has raised up in this church. And I wanted to thank God for them and to thank them for their service Uh, I was telling Pastor Mike that while I was in Iraq that um, I never experienced even an eighth of a second of concern about the welfare of the body, knowing the the capable hands that our church is in. And so thank you to all of the men here who are elders. But Peter says, the elders who are among you, and he's writing to Christians who were dispersed in various locations in what would be modern-day Turkey, kind of in that area, due to persecution. And he says to them, I exhort. Um, The word exhort is a word of encouragement. It's a word of instruction. And so he's going to lay out now specifically what that exhortation is. You might even call it a pastor's job description. The elders who are among you, I exhort. And then I want you to notice before he gets into the exhortation, he says, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Peter was walking really in a way of humility. He said, I who am a fellow elder. He he could have said, um, you know, I'm the, was the leader among all of the apostles. He could have said many, many things, but you can see the humility that is brought into his life. And if you know the story of Peter, you know that he was a gregarious, Um, take charge kind of a guy, the first one to speak up, willing to take on whatever task that was at hand. And when Jesus told him that he was going to be leaving, uh, Peter objected to all of this. And and Jesus went on to tell him, uh, before the the rooster crows a a couple of times, you're going to deny me uh, several times. And we all know the story of how Peter, who had been so loved by Christ, uh, cared for by Christ for several years, in Jesus' most horrible moment, he betrayed his, his love for Christ, if you will. Peter went from being a man of self-confidence, uh, very sincere, uh, believing that he had the capacity to do you know, leap over tall buildings in a single bound, if you will. But he experienced his own frailty, his own humanity, and he denied Christ. And uh, so you remember when Jesus rose from the dead, as he appeared to the lady, a couple of the women He said, I want you to go tell all of the apostles that I've been raised from the dead 
and Peter. Jesus understood the mindset and the heart of Peter, the terrible despair he must have been in, realizing how he had betrayed Christ, if you will. And Jesus wanted to restore him. And thus, in the book of Acts, when the church really was born, Peter became the first gospel preacher. So Jesus took a man who had failed miserably, if you will, and restored him, reinstated him, and used him. And so in this little section here, just a few thoughts. Peter was walking not only in humility um, because that failure on his part, that restoration by Christ brought a humility into his life. He was also walking in forgiveness. He understood that though he had failed Christ, he was a forgiven man. So he, he's walking in forgiveness. And, and for you and myself, uh, when we sin, as we just sang, you know, Christ came here uh, to seek and to save that which is lost. He didn't come to condemn, but he came to save. And when we confess our sins, when we turn to Jesus, what does he do? Does he uh, chide us? Does he condemn us? No, he does not. He forgives us. And I know Peter never forgot what he had done, but he also walked in and clung to the reality of forgiveness and restoration. Um, so walking in humility, walking in forgiveness, and then also walking in encouragement. He says, I want to exhort you. I want to encourage you. And Peter was able to reach out to these fellow elders at a level um, that they could relate to, and he certainly could relate to. Uh, he knew how to encourage people because he had been encouraged by the Lord. And as you go through various trials and troubles in your life, uh, what happens is if you go through them and if you allow God to have his way with you, uh, he develops within you that perseverance and that ability to care for and encourage other people. He was also walking in hope. Um, and, and let me just back up on the forgiveness part. When he says here, a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Let me just develop that little thought for a moment. The Bible does say that there were many of his followers who observed him on the cross from afar. They were not close, they were at a distance. It is possible that even though Peter had denied Jesus, that he did witness Christ's sufferings. But when he says here, a witness of the sufferings of Christ, we know, as we've been talking about, that he betrayed him, and yet he sees himself as a forgiven man. That's what I'm trying to say to you. Um, he, he could have said many things, but he said, I'm, I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ. He could have said, hey, I'm the guy that blew it, but he didn't. And, um, and then also walking in hope, he says, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. What a, what a beautiful bunch of truths there are just in that first verse. Let me just read it again very quickly. The elders who are among you, I exhort or I encourage. I who am a fellow elder, by the way, not to be smart or anything about the Catholic Church, but Peter is, was not the first pope. He, he lists it right here. I'm just one of you. I'm just a fellow elder, just like you and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. 
and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. He knew what the future held, and he understood there's coming a day when Christ, who is our life, will appear in glory, then we also will appear with him. So he begins now then to give this exhortation. It's pretty short. It's really in verses 2 and 3 and 4, if you will. But he says, this is the job description of a pastor, of an elder. He says, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you. The word shepherd literally means to care for. It includes the idea of feeding and leading the church. And leading the church involves protecting as well as providing guidance and care. And so that's really the role of a pastor. And a little bit of historical uh, church governance development. Um, you know, originally it was the apostles who were the leaders. And uh, then the apostles appointed elders, as we see in the book of Acts. And there was a plurality of elders, if you will, in any given congregation. But then over time, uh, we see a man like Timothy being raised up over a number of churches, Titus as well. And then down through the history of the church, though a church uh, has a plurality of elders, there's always a person whom God has raised up to be the, the senior leader, if you will, the senior pastor. And you can see that in the Old Testament. God always raises up a man, but there are many, many people that he works with. And um, so he says, shepherd the flock of God, take care of God's people, uh, guide them through the word of God, protect them by pointing out the truth, uh, the lies of the devil, and to do whatever is necessary to uh, care for the people. Serving, he says, as overseers. The word overseers is very similar to the word shepherd. It, it involves administration. It involves organization. Um, and then he gives three specific positives and negatives of how to shepherd and how to oversee. First of all, he says in the middle of verse 2, not by constraint. In other words, uh, it's not because you have to do this. Um, or not grudgingly. Um, but he says rather willingly or eagerly. You'd, you'd think that this would not be necessary to say, uh, but it can become uh, a chore for pastors. And they can go from being excited about their ministries, they can go from being eager to looking upon it as a burden and, and something that they really don't want to do. There could be many reasons for that, but... If that is the case of anybody who is an elder, they ought to really take some time with the Lord to figure out how did I get in this position where I don't have an eagerness, I, I feel this, I have to do this. Um, and God can straighten that out. So that's the first thing, that to, to pastor and to be an elder and so on, it's not by constraint. That you shouldn't be uh, forced to do this. You shouldn't feel forced to do it, but eagerly and willingly. And then he says, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Now, apparently, uh, the elders back in the early church were compensated well. Um, not that they would become uh, wealthy, but they were compensated well. I don't think Peter would say, don't be in it for the money unless there was some money involved. And the Bible speaks of the responsibility of the congregation to support those in leadership. In fact, it speaks of 
elders who rule well and are diligent in the word uh, to receive double honor. Um, but he says, don't be in it for the money. Uh, cute little story of a pastor who was pastoring a tiny little church, barely made enough money to get by, but he was a good pastor, he was a good teacher, and he received a call to go and pastor a much larger congregation, a, a wealthier congregation. And so he came home and he announced to his wife, he said, honey, I got a letter or a call today about this other uh, opportunity. And he said, I, I really think we should pray about this. He said, I don't know, you know, maybe God would have me to stay here. Uh, maybe God would have me to go there. I, I don't know, we should pray about it. And she said to him, well, that's fine. You go ahead and pray, but I'm going to go upstairs and start packing. <laughs> um, I did want to comment on how generous this church is. I, I literally cannot believe the generosity, and I'm not talking about my compensation. I'm talking about the, the consistent willingness on your part to give to the Lord and especially the support of missions and to reach out. I mean, it's incredible given the size of our congregation. Um, if you could look at the numbers, you'd say, where does all of this money come from? It comes from God and it comes through people who are generous and gracious. In verse three, he goes on, nor is being lords over those entrusted to you. And may I just um, back up to verse two for a moment where he says, shepherd the flock of God. The flock does not belong to the pastor. We'll often as pastors say, well, my church is located or you know, we refer to it in that way. But you as a sheep, you don't belong to me. You belong to God. He purchased you with his own blood. And, and I love that. He says, shepherd the flock of God that has been entrusted to you. So um, that's a wonderful truth. And uh, you, you belong to the Lord. In verse 3, Nora's being lords or tyrants, really, or masters over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So... Uh, pastors have to watch out for this um, being lords over uh, people because there's the tendency for pride and so on. And people look to their pastors for guidance and they make many serious decisions based on what their pastors say. And it's easy for a pastor to forget that he's really called to be an example and to start thinking that he's kind of in charge of everybody. And, and I've certainly struggled with that in my life. And one of the benefits I received by going to pastor's conferences is to be reminded of this very thing. Uh, pastor Chuck Smith uh, would always remind us, you know, you're to be a servant of the people. You're not over the people in that sense. You're there to serve the people. So he says, you shepherd them, nor don't be lords over them, those that have been entrusted to you. And by the way, just a couple of little, another little thought, I just got a number of these things. Um, you'll notice in this job description here, there's nothing said about the size of the congregation. There's nothing said about the notoriety of the pastor. There's nothing said about any of those kinds of things. Those are things that are not part of what ministry is all about. God is the one who is responsible for the assignment of whatever is going to take place in a church. And um, when we get to heaven, God isn't going to say to the pastors who pastored, lar pastored large churches, hey, you guys come up to the front and those of you with smaller churches, you can just wait in the back somewhere. That's not it at all. The real 
issue is simply being faithful to God. We've had uh, over the course, by the way, this week we begin our 38th year of ministry here at Calvary Chapel this very week. And uh, at one time, our church was the largest church other than the Catholic Church in Visalia. So we've, we've been big, we've been small, we've almost died, we've been, uh, had the paddles put on our hearts. <laughs> uh, we've had uh, all kinds of things. And God is faithful to work in a pastor's life and extract from him any care about the size of the church. Now, let me say this. Of course, any pastor would want a church to be healthy, to grow uh, for the, the blessings of, of God's grace in people's lives. But uh, those things are not on our agenda, and they shouldn't be. Um, really, it's such a blessing, and God is only concerned with our faithfulness. But we're to be examples to the flock. That's very convicting, isn't it? Being an example. You know, Kevin Meisner, we've worked together for many years, and um, when we've had to deal with difficult situations that have come up, um, Kevin would ask me, Pastor Bob, could you come and help with this? And I'm certain that on many occasions, I made the situation worse. Uh, and on rare occasions, I would say to him, hey, we have a problem. And I would say, but I didn't start it. <laughs> I think I said that maybe twice. <laughs> um, so these are important things. These are very important things. And, and when we have men here who are elders, these are men that are, we're certainly flawed, we're certainly imperfect, but we're, these are men that are, qualified. And then in verse 4, he speaks of the future. He says, and when the chief shepherd appears, here Peter again is recognizing, hey, we're just under shepherds. The chief shepherd, he's going to appear. He's coming back. You will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. <clears throat> now, in the Greek culture, in the Olympics, the winners, much like today, they would put a little uh, leaf, a laurel, kind of a crown on them to show that they won the event. But uh, they'd wear that, they'd come home and, you know, they're proud of their little little crown. But uh, and they would put it on the next day probably and it still looked okay. But probably by the third day it started to wilt and by the fourth day, no doubt, his wife said, take that thing off your head. But pastors, as Christ, all Christians, will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the things we've done in the body, whether they were good or meaningless. And he has a crown for pastors. Um, so... One of the realities in the life of the church is that pastors are so often dishonored um, and hurt by people in the church. Yet Jesus says, there's coming a day when I'm going to reward you for your faithfulness. That will be a moment of sobriety and for those people who have caused trouble in the church um, and have, and we'll talk more about this humility in a minute or two. But there's coming a special reward for pastors, uh, and there's a reward for each one of us. In verse 5, he says something that's a little hard to understand exactly who he's talking about here. But he says, likewise, you younger people, and some people think he's speaking of literally younger in age or just, uh, just the rest of the congregation that are not elders. And by the way, the real emphasis on the word elder is not age. 
its maturity. Um, so he says, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders uh, because God has placed them over you. And that's the calling to submit yourselves to your elders. But then he says, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So what Peter is saying here is that the people of God, that would be you, should submit to and respect church leaders. Very, very important. And this is an area um, that we all should, you know, listen to very carefully uh, to be respectful of those that have been placed in leadership. And we should respect one another. It goes both ways, not just one way. How does a person do this, this submission? Well, the, the idea that's implied here is that people should act without grumbling. Um, I looked the word grumbling up last night in the Greek, spent five hours studying it. Do you know what it means? You got it, it means to grumble. <laughs> that's, not hum that's not submissiveness. If you're grumbling, complaining, you should stop it. I've done it. I've done it within our movement. Gossiping is another way that has no, that's not humility, it's not submission. Going around and saying things about your pastor. You shouldn't gossip. We should not gossip about anybody. There's much said in the Bible about gossip. It is a sin. I wish that I had enough faith and humility myself to always say to somebody who says to me, you know, I probably shouldn't say this, but, you know, I wish I would say, well, if you shouldn't say it, then don't. And I'm kind of getting into that attitude in my own life. But the next time somebody begins to gossip and that they're, they know that it's wrong and they're kind of looking for a little a way to get this out and they say, well, you know, I, I shouldn't say this to you. Say, well, good. Then you, you realize you shouldn't say that. Good for you. Then what's the next thing we can talk about? So grumbling and gossiping or divisiveness. You know... It's one of the things, you can find it in the book of Proverbs. It says God hates these, there's six things that he hates, and then there's a seventh, he adds. It's those who cause division. Now, if I were to stand up here, and if you came up and started pulling my hand as hard as you could, or cutting me, you'd, you'd be hurting my body, you'd be... You'd be dividing my body. We are a body of believers. We're in Christ. And so when we grumble, when we gossip, and when we're divisive, when we are sectarian, uh, you know, people say, well, I'm of Peter, well, I'm of Paul. Uh, that's divisive. It's sin. It's very, very wrong. And he's saying here, be submissive not just to your pastors, but to everybody. We should all be submissive. Um, this is the body of Christ, and I've been guilty of this. I'm, I'm certain you have. In fact, I think I know you have. No, I'm just kidding. So grumbling, gossiping, being divisive is just the opposite of being humble. So he could be speaking to the entire congregation, not just those who are younger. He could be speaking to those who were unlikely to submit. Peter was no, this wasn't his first rodeo. 
he understood that in any congregation there were people that don't want to submit. I mean, we've been here 38 years. I, I can tell you, I'm not going to get into it, but I mean, I could cite example after example after example of people who they, they just cannot be part of something unless they are in charge of it. And, and I understand that. It, it's called pride. But God is the one who sets the church in order. And um, this um, failure to be submissive, uh, one thing that, one little saying that we think is helpful to people who are like this and they're, they're going to go away is we're going to say, well, if you're going to go away because you can't submit, uh, don't go away mad, just go away. Something to think about. You know, you don't have to be mad. Just if you don't like it, you can't get along here, that's okay. Just, but don't be mad. Just go do this to some other church. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Bad joke. As usual. So what does humility mean? Because he says here, be clothed with humility. I, I wonder what comes to your mind when you think of how would you define humility? You know, we sometimes maybe think of it as a, a soft-spoken person who, oh, you know, yes, thank you, but it's all the Lord, and, you know, this kind of an attitude. But really, humility um, is, it, it means that a Christian is depending willingly upon Jesus Christ. It means to be low before God. A humble person is depending upon Jesus Christ. That's what humility is, to depend upon Jesus Christ. That's number one. And secondly, it's to see others better than themselves. That is so convicting, to see other people as better than yourself. Um, I mean, think about your own life, how you view people. Uh, you know, we... We put them in categories. But to be humble is to literally say, you know, that person is better than me. And to see them in that regard, that's, that's what we're to be clothed with. And you talk about prayer. I did want to mention, by the way, there's a Tuesday morning prayer meeting at 6 o'clock every Tuesday morning. That's another opportunity from 6 to 7. But we're to be clothed with humility and why? Well, right there at the end of verse 5, quoting from uh, the Old Testament uh, in the book of Proverbs, in the book of Isaiah, actually the book of Proverbs, he says, God resists the proud. Imagine that, he resists the proud, or he opposes the proud. So even though God wants to work in a person's life, if a person is determined to have it their way, God is opposed to that. He just can't work with pride. It, it, it just doesn't fit well. But he, he gives grace or he favors the humble. So as we were singing, how wonderful that we can depend on Jesus. How wonderful that we can really trust him. We don't have to live this life alone. That's humility. Humility. And then to see people as better than us. And think of this. Jesus, the, the just, died for the unjust that he might bring us to God. How horrible we were. And yet Christ came and he bore all of our sins. He viewed you as his bride. And he died for you. So God resists the proud, but he gives grace or he favors the humble. Therefore, verse 6, in light of that, and in light of everything he's been saying about submission and humility, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. It makes all the sense in the world. 
don't you want God's favor in your life? We don't earn it, but we can position ourselves to receive it by depending upon him and to humble ourselves before him under the mighty hand of God. You know, when we're walking in pride, we don't experience the power of God in our lives. But when we're walking in humility, we have a little bit of an understanding of how mighty and of how powerful and of how loving and of how gracious and forgiving God is. To humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. There's a reward for the humble. God will exalt you in whatever ways he wants to. And then verse 7 is so beautiful. This is a profound formula that can stop worry in its tracks. Verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Or give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. It's the idea of giving them to him. I was at the gym the other day. Uh, I just walk there at the gym, and uh, I don't need, you know, I've already got this other all squared away. But there's an older man there. He must be in his 90s, and he's had some type of a stroke or something. And one of the nice trainers there, uh, I see him working with this man, and the, the poor man is so frail and feeble, and I've been watching the improvement, and I can see a little bit of improvement, and one of the things that they do is the trainer will throw this little small medicine ball to the guy, and he catches it, and then he throws it back, and then the trainer throws it back, and he catches it, and back and forth, and I was observing the other day I, I was looking in the man's eyes how even though he was old and frail and all of that, you could see he had his wits about him and boy, he had his mind right on that medicine ball and he was catching it and then he was able to throw it back. And this is the idea here, to throw on to the Lord, to go to the Lord. All of your anxieties, whatever, whatever you may be worried about today, you could, I'm sure you have a short and a long list. There's no gift of worrying, by the way. It's not a spiritual gift. God has not called us, all you who are troubled, worry, 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 and I'll help you. It's, it's just, God is saying, look, give your worries to me. Now, the problem with this man and the trainer is they kept throwing the ball back and forth. If the man had just thrown the ball and the guy kept it, that's exactly what Peter is saying. Give those worries to God, the mighty hand of God, God who cannot lie. Faithful is he who calleth you, who also will do it. His promises are yes and amen. So casting all of your care upon him, and the reason, for he cares for you. Another interpretation of that is, it matters to him about you. He's concerned about you. You may, you may think, well, he might be concerned about a lot of people, but I don't think he cares about me. You may feel that way, but that's not true. It matters to him about you. So when you're worrying and you're troubled, it matters to him. He doesn't want you uh, going around all shook up and depressed and dis in despair. Uh, imagine how that must hurt his heart to know, hey, look, haven't you read my promises? Don't you know that I'm going to take care of you? Don't you know that I'm working these things out? Don't you know that I'm in charge? I know that it hurts. I know that there's trouble. But, but don't you believe me? You're, you're, you're just so in despair, and, I, and I've been there so many times. 
And I've also experienced many times living this out, actually going to him. And I like to say to, like in that song, to have a little talk with Jesus. To really specifically, <coughs> excuse me, say to him, Lord, this is what I'm troubled about. This is what I can't seem to get over. This is what's bothering me. This is the sin in my life. Whatever it is. In this case, in the context, it's really talking about uh, worry. Excuse me. So it matters to him concerning you. In verse 8, he says, to be sober or to be self-controlled. Be vigilant, which means to be alert. So these are two things now. He's saying, look, you control yourself. Be alert because your adversary, you have an adversary, the devil. He walks about like a roaring lion. What a picture. We've all seen the king of the jungle just the, you know, what is it, MGM, whichever one of those has that lion. I can't even think about it, but I think that's what it is. But we've all seen the, the strength of the, the king of the jungle just roaring. He's walking around. And of course, he can only be in one place at one time, but he has a whole army of demons. There's a whole strategic plan to devour you. He can't take you out of the hand of God, but he can destroy the work of God within you. He can tempt you. He can lead you into discouragement. He can distract you. He knows you better than you know yourself. The devil existed before the world was created. He knows mankind perfectly. He knows how to push your buttons. He has studied human nature. And despair is one of the great temptations that he tries to get people into. So the antidote in spiritual warfare is pretty simple. It's control yourself Be vigilant, be alert, and don't be ashamed to go to your friends and to say, you know, I can't control myself. I'm having trouble. I'm, I'm overwhelmed with my troubles. Could you pray for me that I can be sober-minded? But be, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring, roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So even today, he's looking around. You remember when Jesus said to Peter, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. And he sure did. In verse 9, he says, resist him. That's the simple way of standing against him. And the primary method of resistance is faith in the word of God. That is what Jesus did when he was being attacked in the wilderness, the devil would throw a temptation his way and Jesus would say, it is written, it is written, it is written. He defaulted to the word of God. He is the word of God. So we resist him through the word of God, steadfast in the faith, but just hanging in there, trusting God. And if we resist him, James says, he'll go away. And he'll come back on another day. But if you resist him, he will flee. He encourages his readers there in verse 9, saying, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. You know, he wanted them to know, look, you're not the only people going through trouble. The whole Christian world is going through trouble. Yes, you're suffering, but don't, don't think, oh, you know, I'm the only person who's suffering. All people suffer. As Philip opened the service, 
The world is filled with tribulation. We're not the only ones. You're not the only one. I think that's where the statement, misery loves company, came from. I love that statement. Hey, let's get together and be miserable. You know, I love to be miserable. You're miserable, I'm miserable. We can enjoy it. Verse 10, he kind of talks about the, the end result of the suffering, and it's a prayer. He says, but may the God of all grace, how beautiful is that? But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory, that's what we've been called to, by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, after you have suffered a while, here it is. May he perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So in the kindness of God, he's called you to share in his eternal glory through Christ. After you've suffered a little while, he's going to restore you. Whatever you've lost, he's going to restore you in some way. He's going to support you. He's going to strengthen you. And he's going to place you on a firm foundation. To him be the glory and the dominion or the power forever and ever. Uh, Peter understood the centrality of God. Who, who is greater than God? He deserves all of the glory He's in charge forever and ever. And then he closes the letter out by acknowledging that his friend and fellow minister, Silvanus, perhaps Silas, by Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him. He says, I've written to you briefly. That means that Paul dictated this letter and Silvanus was his secretary, if you will. I've written to you briefly exhorting, encouraging, he's, he's, he's commenting now on all five chapters, they're an exhortation and it's a testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, um, and it could be the city of Babylon at that day, it could be just a reference to cities and, and places, we don't really know for sure, but he's speaking of the, the church that's in Babylon, the elect together with you, they greet you, they're sending their greetings. And so does Mark, my son, his nephew Mark. In verse 14, he says, please stand and greet one another before the service gets going. No, he doesn't say that, but it's kind of like that. He says, greet one another with a kiss of love. Now, in that part of the world, this kiss of love on this cheek and that cheek, this existed before Christianity, and so it was a cultural deal. I was just there in the Middle East, and uh, these guys were kissing me all day long, uh, over here, over there, and I was trying to I kiss you or kiss you, you know what, it's weird. Uh, but since we want to be biblical, we're going to take a moment now, okay? Are you ready? You kiss on this cheek? No, I'm kidding. But he's just talking about the love we have. Greet one another with a kiss of love. And peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Next week, we'll start in the book of 2 Peter chapter, 2 Peter chapter 1. And I do want to invite you on Wednesdays. We're having a great time in the Gospel of John wanted to also take a moment to say thank you for all of those who worked so hard to support the Vacation Bible School uh, ministry that took place here. Um, thank you so much for what you've done. If we can have the ushers come on up, please. And as they're coming to receive the offering, um, in this last worship song, Take your burdens and give them to Jesus. If you don't know Christ, call upon Christ today to save you. Ask him to save you. If you've been away from Jesus, you've, you've been backslidden, you've been lukewarm, you're not 
where you used to be. Why don't you just ask him, say, Lord, you know my problem. I don't want to be in this place. I want to get back to where you want me to be. Let's use this last time of worship here to communicate with him. Let's pray, please. Thank you, Father, for this time, and thank you for uh, the generosity that you express through the body of Christ. Uh, we pray for Mark Bradley and Jiggs Travis down in Belize. We pray for Jiggs's brother, who's been very ill right at the time Jiggs left. Uh, we pray for your grace in his life. And we just thank you, Father, and we pray you would receive these tithes and offerings now. In Jesus' name, amen.